Development Collaboration Division of Thailand's National Science and Technology Development Agency, or NASDA. Ladies and gentlemen, NASDA and our co-host, the National Science, Technology and Innovation Policy Office, and the Council of the University President of Thailand, are pleased to welcome you to the National Dialogue on Responsible Conduct of Research in Thailand. I would like to introduce the distinguished speaker of the dialogue today. The first one, Professor Yong Yun Yutabung, former Minister, Ministry of Science and Technology, former Deputy Prime Minister, former President of NASDA, Committee of the International Biotech Committee, and Senior Consultant of NASDA. Next, Ms. So E. Hamad, President of C Consulting and former Director. Division of Education and Integrity, U.S. Office of Research Integrity. Then, Professor Yong Poo Wan, Department of Pediatric, Faculty of Medicine, Jalalongkorn University. Professor Thir Yot Mithit Suwanipun, Assistant President of Research, Seya University. And representative from uh, the National Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy Office, Dr. Kantana Wadichkorn, Assistant Secretary General. And Dr. Wasit Patwari, the Council of University President of Thailand, or CUPT. Now it's time. We will begin today's event with an opening remark from the Executive Vice President of NASDA, Professor Prasit Pritokon Kantin. Please welcome Professor Prasit. Research. There are many, many ways to do it. Somebody do it really strictly, very nice, very reliable, which is maybe a little bit size. Somebody may be a little bit sloppy, and, and the sloppiness may increase. Somebody have some bias, somebody has, has some conflict of interest, and, and, and the right side is, is the, is the First one, first one that we would not like to see. So, so basically, people, a lot of people probably working in this area, a number of people working on, on, on the left side. The idea is that, do we need to move these people to the left? Uh, idea of working on responsible conduct research is not to catch up people on the right. That's that, that's something that we need to do, but, but that, that's not the main problem. The main problem is, is to move the people to do research, to make it better. So, so it improves the research in, in general. Uh, do we have the problem in Thailand? Uh, we have not so much, but 
should be, should be aware. Should be aware. This is the list of the of the publication that are that reflected because of misconduct. Thailand is ranked number something here. Uh, not so bad, not so bad, but also not so good. <laughs> so good. <laughs> it's all at the end of this. But, but you can see Australian Internet is also here, Singapore is here. So, so, so it, it's not really unusual, it's really unusual, let's say. And the misconduct can have a lot of damage. I just, just, just show you the, the possible definition. Uh, briefly speaking, the Texel Smith Prime has to pay $3 billion US dollar as a fine to the US government because of uh, what, what is called outcome switching. That, that's a practice that considered as inappropriate in filing uh, FDA approval. But to be honest, outcome switching is something that our research is doing, are doing every day. <laughs> They're writing the paper so they, What it means is that they propose to do something along the way, they see something better. So they change the purpose to fit the, the, out, the, the result. Fit the result. That, that, that's something need to be careful. In, in, in the worst case, the, the people they, they need to pay a lot. So in order to make the, the, the research results and researcher trustworthy, there are requirements that people need to meet. For so the legal requirement, the standard requirement, the, the, the product research need, need to be, let's say, responsible. We need to make sure that the research is reproducible and people have research, have performed, do not do any research is conduct. This is particular uh, important when, when the government try to push the research. And policy makers try to push for output and outcome. And, and do not aware that without leaving the room for failure, people can, if people cannot fail, they must do something to be not fail. And so we, we need to let us less awareness and size and technology are high risk. It can fail. And at least, oh, they, they should fail honestly rather, rather than achieve without with, uh, some, some, some misconduct. So, the cause of research uh, misconduct may be many. For example, it may be purely sloppiness, we do not do the work really well. Uh, in adequate understanding of concept of misconduct, there are a lot of people who do not really know what cannot do. For example, people, students, may not report a negative result to the professor. They report only the positive result. So the professor do not aware, do not know that there are a number of negative results. But once the, the result becomes positive, the student goes to the professor and says, oh, I achieved this, and so on, and they write a paper, and so on. Uh, they may have not adequate knowledge of research literature, so they may plagiarize the idea from other people without, without the knowledge that the idea or the work have, have already been done. Or in any way, expertise in methodology. For uh, example, the statistical analysis, equipment can be malfunction, and so the result is wrong. Uh, there come crunch, people need to do a lot of things in the university, you do a lot more for all uh, <laughs> writing work, uh, pressure to deliver output, and some one of the other factors that we may practice here is over rewarding. Uh, the biggest award for a paper in Thailand that I know is 500,000 baht, which is a lot. It's a lot. Uh, and probably uh, quite risky in a sense, and NASCAR has tried to open, try to figure out which steps of the research. There is a have any steps. Every step have, can have a flow. We cannot cover everything. We cannot do everything, to be honest. But we need to understand where is the major pitfall of our organization and try to 
try to ignore it. And so we try to NASCAR try to, to work on, on these three main areas that is the research activity, the reproducibility, and appropriate gain and, and credit for, for people. And of course we need to perform uh, accommodate. We need to follow the, the, the safety and, and the legal requirement when, when we are doing the research. Uh, this is the, our NASDA action plan. Yeah, we have already set up the Office of Research Integrity, implementing, we are implementing duplication detecting software. We are trying to, to strengthen the good research practice, for example, uh, equipment, calibration is already done. Uh, recording and record keeping is something that we are looking at. And, and data management, monitoring system, authorship, and so on. We are trying to follow the quality requirement and the other major thing that is related to the meeting today is raising awareness and advocacy of, of reproducibility of research and also we try to provide education in this regard. So that, that's something I would like to, to, to just, just start introducing you. That, uh, I am sure that today we will have an opportunity to, to, to listen to, to uh, many, many experts in the field and so Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Rasid. May I invite the first district speaker today, Professor Yong Yuki Tawong, to give a talk in the topic of ethics of science and technology, role of researchers. Please welcome Professor Yong Yu. friends, colleagues from near and far, from as near as Malaysia, from as far as the United States. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Dr. Prasit for organizing this, uh, I think is very important first in the uh, uh, research uh, management in Thailand in terms of international discussion on responsible conduct of research because that really is the first you know uh, point where we where we start on the journey of finding new things and uh, finding good uses for them uh, I think that uh, today I will give a very brief uh, a very I'm not sure so brief but uh, a broad review of uh, responsible conduct from my point of view, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, take the uh, kind of uh, a detour, a detour uh, of science and technology in general, uh, right from historical time. The author Rabelais, I think he's a French uh, person, said that science without conscience is nothing but ruin to the soul. I think that is the first motto that we could all bear in mind because uh, uh, we have to start from science and the technology is really derived science so uh, we have to uh, take his words to heart. Uh, more recently, Mahatma Gandhi, he talked about the uh, seven social sins and sin number five, science without humanity. Of course, wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, knowledge without character, commerce without morality, religion without sacrifice, and politics without principle. They're all social sins. But for us, science without humanity is a cardinal sin. And uh, coming to the present day, I would like to quote the eminent uh, uh, Koji Omi, who was a former finance minister, not a scientist, not even a scientist, 
but uh, he has been so uh, kind of the main leader in science and technology policy field. He organizes the Science and Technology for Society Forum every year in Kyoto in October. And uh, this series has been continuing for some time and is now the leading series for people interested in policy. And he said this, in recent years, science and technology has progressed very rapidly, brought tremendous benefits to our daily lives. But uh, advances have brought about problems such as global warming, ethical concerns in biosciences, information on security issues in ICT. These are the so-called lights and shadows of science and technology. I think these are very nice words that uh, we should all remember. Science has both lights and shadows. Now, it will not go. So uh, what are the ethical concerns on science, technology, and innovation? Well, this is not just about researchers. It's really concerns about science and technology in general. First of all, what we do are all in good faith, but they may have unintended effects. Well, we could say that global warming, our main global problem right now, could be the result, a result of too much technology. And uh, the consequence uh, of which is global warming. Robots are now coming up very rapidly, but uh, apart from robots, you know, robots, and many people are very interested in romantic robots, but they can also, you know, be vicious robots, which can be used as weapons. Automated vehicles, well, they are also robots in a, in a sense. And just last week there was a news that the first trial of an uh, automatic bus, you know, uh, uh, already had an accident with a slow running car or something like that. So that makes you uh, concerned. Big data and privacy, of course, everyone is now worried about big data, although they are, of course, uh, very useful things to come, you know, now and in the future. And very, you know, uh, shortly ahead, we can expect enhanced humans. In fact, we now have enhanced humans. You know, we are all a little bit of cy cyborgs because uh, these are our kind of uh, the mechanical tools that we have with our body and we cannot part with them. So. In the future, these tools can be incorporated into our bodies, and uh, that's just the beginning. Because then, in the future, we can design the newborns right from the start, design their genes, and uh, so many people are now calling them post-humans. They're not really humans, uh, but uh, they're not machines, but they are post-humans. Some of the things you see in Star Wars and you never thought that it could be reality but in about 30 to 50 years time, you'll see more of them. And of course, genomic medicine, medicine where the genome really helps you, you know, right from the uh, diagnosis to treatment and prevention. So uh, in the uh, last couple of years, the National Science, the Technology and Innovation Policy uh, Office, uh, together with uh, the UNESCO office, the Thailand UNESCO office of the Ministry of, Edu of Education and uh, the National Science and Technology Development Agency have come, and many other people have come together to form the National Committee on Ethics and Science and Technology, uh, which is uh, uh, set up by the policy office to study and make recommendations on ethical issues in science and technology with collaboration from UNESCO and NASTA. And the agenda are to look at the genomics and life processes, uh, artificial intelligence, big data, robotics, climate change, 
and research ethics. These are the first major agenda and uh, under the responsibility of the people you see on the screen. So now I come to the main issues of today. It's the ethical and social responsibility of researchers. Uh, and we all know that uh, researchers have to be honest in our profession, in doing the work, and in reporting the work, and in uh, behaving in society. And researchers have to be aware of implications of the works to the society, including potential dangers and not only just benefits. And um, examples of ethics issues is to acknowledge and give credit to co-workers at all levels. This is really almost the first kind of uh, principle. Credit where credit is due and acknowledge them as co-authors or uh, you know, uh, proper, properly elsewhere. And we have to help the team and others as appropriate, thank you. So this is really to uphold the spirit of cooperation in science. We have to have respect for professional rules. These professional rules are often unspoken. They're kind of something that you have to know if you're in the trade, such as no overclaim of credits. Dr. Prasit already gave you some you know, specific examples. Uh, no announcement of results which have not been previously scrutinized or proven. Um, conflicts of interest. Try to have no conflicts of interest. And these in include benefiting self or others through bias. In, for example, in reviews, just in reviews for publications or awards. Or thwarting other people's advances through non scientific reasons ruining their reputation, that sort of thing. Gaining credit of others for reviews of their work. We have to ensure responsibility of results without bias and not take advantage of co-workers, including, I think this has suddenly become very fashionable in politics and in entertainment, that is the improper sexual conduct. There is improper sexual conduct in science, in the labs, and elsewhere. And uh, normally, we try to, try to look the other way. We don't see what's happening. But I think in the future, this will be a real issue. Do not favor others through unjustified credits, such as the authorship. Sometimes you give authorship to the head of your department, because maybe you, know, you will get a better raise next time next time around. So these are un irresponsible conducts. So more examples such as honesty in obtaining and interpreting results. We have to acknowledge results even if it's contradictory to expectation. By the way, I have found myself professionally that the results that contradict our expectation are usually more interesting results. And they lead to something, you know, better than before. Because if you only want to confirm your own kind of uh, starting point, then that's everyone also expects that sort of thing. But if something unexpected happened and you go and find out why, then it's much more interesting. No overclaim of results. No fabrication of or cosmetic treatment of results. No selective adoption or overthrow of results. These are the things that uh, Dr. Prasit already spoke about and I expect uh, uh, our, my colleagues will also talk about them later on. Honesty in financial affairs. Uh, this is a very important uh, uh, part of research and uh, sometimes it's so easy when money is near that uh, you, know, you can really uh, uh, do something that is not not proper or not appropriate. No causation of, of harm to others, including to uh, animals, you know, uh, because uh, animals also have their pains and, you know, and, and their rights. 
no betrayal of public faith, responsibility to duties and accountability of your actions, kindness and understanding, love for fellow workers, and passion in work. So I think that uh, these are the kind of the ground rules for ethics of conducting research. And um, just to uh, give you some concrete examples of irresponsible conduct, I will give you, uh, you know, some noted, no, uh, celebrated examples of violation of research, if this will allow me. Maybe I put in too, too many pictures, huh? Sorry. <laughs> This is to increase your suspense. fraud is uh, a very serious crime uh, and uh, very serious irresponsible conduct. Overclaim of results and interpretation, republication of results, although they are good results, but you must not republish them as though they are something new. Plagiarism, copyright violation, and false claims of priority. So, uh, there's the definition, many definitions of scientific misconduct. I will give you two definitions, both from the Scandinavia. One is a Danish definition. Intention or gross negligence leading to fabrication of the scientific message or a false credit or emphasis given to a scientist. The Swedish definition is a bit longer. In intentional distortion of the research process by fabrication of data, text, hypothesis or methods from another researcher's manuscript, uh, form or publication, or distortion of the research process in other ways. Uh, I got this from the Lancet. And uh, some examples from history. The most celebrated example, in fact, the, this is almost the first one I knew of when I was a student. And this is called the case of the Piltdown Man, where fragments of a skull and a jawbone collected you know, uh, early last century uh, uh, from Piltdown, Sussex, was claimed by experts, Mr. Dawson, to be fossilized remains of the, the missing link, the early man, which was the missing link between ape and man. So this was uh, believed for many years until in 1953 it was exposed as a surgery, very crude surgery, uh, a, a very crude forgery, in fact, uh, taking lo uh, lower jaw bone of an ape and combined with the skull of a fully developed modern man. So uh, this was the case of the Piltdown Man, which was never solved, but many people expect that uh, it was Mr. Charles Dawson himself. Now the next case is a little bit more complicated, so please bear with me, because I think this is important, because it involves the intricacies in, in science research and in uh, you know, in uh, working with colleagues. Uh, around about 1986, uh, David Baltimore, a very important scientist, co-authored a scientific paper on immunology with uh, uh, Teresa Imanishi Carrick and others. And then the postdoc, Margaret O'Toole, uh, she said she could not reproduce some of their experiments and accused Imanishi Carrick of fabrication. So this is a very serious case. Uh, Baltimore initially refused, but then retracted the paper. But Imanishi Carey never retracted the paper. So there was a big public investigation uh, from an NIH, uh, which accused Imanishi Carey uh, of falsifying data, and recommended that she be barred from receiving research grants for 10 years. So she was penalized. And Baltimore then 
had to resign from presidency of the Rockefeller University. Uh, so it became very, very uh, uh, serious. But later on, in 1996, a government appointed appeals panel reviewed the case again and dismissed the charge against Imanishik Kerry. Uh, Baltimore, by the way, uh, is admired by many in the scientific community for standing behind a junior faculty member, Imanishi Kerry, at great personal and professional cost. And uh, there is something like this later on that I will tell you about. Uh, so next, uh, easier case, the Summerlin case. This was also uh, exposed while I was uh, kind of a senior student. Uh, there's a guy called Summerlin who claimed to trans he, that he could transplant corneas, glands, and skin on animals that would not be rejected, even cross species. He was discovered only after a few years when a lab assistant noticed that the so-called skin grafts were really drawn with a marker. <laughs> and all the rest of his work was turned out to be fake as well. So this was simple look. It's uh, quite unbelievable that there's this, this rat. There are many cases where People just stole other people's work, like this guy, Mr. Solomon, who was assistant professor. He was asked to peer review a paper by Helena Warschlicht Rothbard. Yeah, he sent back negative, no. He sent back, no, we cannot publish this. He delayed the publication. And then he turned around and submitted the same paper to another journal. He was found out when, in amazing twist of fate, because I think in that field, perhaps there were very few experts. So Helena Wachley Rothbard was asked to peer review that paper. <laughs> this is my paper. So she recognized it as her own. Now I'd like to tell you three cases on the, uh, on the stem cells. Uh, of course, the one case, I think you all know about the one case, where the one Usu, you know, uh, claimed that he could um, uh, clone, you know, various, you know, animals. Uh, animals probably true. He said, also, he said he could claim humans. You know, uh, eleven patient-specific stem cell lines. You know, uh, and uh, he, he could clone humans. And um, it it was uh, a fakery, and it was shown to be false. And uh, you know, in fact, uh, uh, there was other unethical conduct as well, for example, using the cells from his, his students or his, his uh, colleagues, you know, junior colleagues and so on. So uh, even his claim that he could clone the dog became a subject to suspicion. And then only three, four years ago, there was this Obokata case, uh, where in 2014, this postdoctoral claim that she could trigger normal cells into uh, to repotential stem cells simply by changing you know, conditions such as pressure or pH or something like that, which was very, you know, very suspicious. But uh, it was published in, I think, in Nature. And then it was investigated by Riken, which was the uh, prime research institute in Japan where she worked. Uh, she, uh, uh, the investigation showed that she manipulated the data and lacked ethics, integrity, and humility as researchers, and papers were re retracted, and Obokata resigned from the institute. But I think that's the fate that uh, perhaps is a little bit too light, because one of her co-workers you know, took it very seriously. He was very sorry, and he committed suicide. And the written president uh, also resigned over this incident, so like David Altimore, Baltimore, uh, uh, um, uh, um, the president, the chemist, uh, Noyori, uh, also over that incident. The last case that I'd like to talk about is the Macchiarini case, just to make sure that uh, they're not all Asians. <laughs> sometimes they're Asians, but sometimes they're from elsewhere. Uh, this guy, Paolo Macchiarini, he claimed to be able to regenerate windpipes, and uh, he regenerated windpipes to 17 or more patients worldwide. 
He said, it's very easy, you know, just see the, the scaffolds, which uh, could be the patients with pipes themselves, or even plastic scaffolds, with stem cells taken from the patients on bone marrow. And uh, he was a con man and uh, very uh, good looking. By the way, they're all good looking. Wang Musuk was also good looking. You know, Obokata was very beautiful. And uh, Machiaridi, very good looking, just like a film star. You know, he planned to marry a famous reporter who reported, you know, his results very favorably. Uh, and he planned to have guests in his wedding, including the Obamas, the Clintons, Putin, and Nicolas Sarkozy, and other world leaders. And Andrea Bocelli was supposed to sing in his, in his wedding. However, it did not occur because most patients later died or suffered serious complications there later, and he turned out to be a con man with a bad family history. So, you see, these are just some examples of uh, the uh, cases that have happened worldwide. And um, the journals are also to blame. For example, the case of Joachim Bolt, where he published in 17 specialist journals on anesthesia, on 88 clinical trials conducted without ethics committee approval, and the case of uh, Fujii, who published 200 fraudulent papers on anesthesia. Now, Thailand is not free from these blames. That's the case of Dr. Uh, well, we should not tell his real name. Dr. Yota Thai, who gave me these data, called him Dr. Volkswagen. <laughs> because I think his, his initials are VW. <laughs> Dr. Volkswagen really published Tremendous, I don't know, maybe thousands of papers. Uh, just the year from uh, uh, 2001 to 2014 alone, he published, according to Scopus, 1,800 papers, something like that. 1,800 papers. It's a kind of like a 100 papers a year uh, in the Scopus uh, uh, index, and also ISI, you know, also very, uh, you know, almost 1,000 papers. and. He had a, well, he has a reasonable edge index you now, 16 or 17. It means that uh, many people believe, believe him and cite him. Maybe he cited himself. Now, you won't be able to see this, but uh, Dr. Yata Tai took the papers from the original publication in 1998 and another one in the, uh, uh, the original paper by someone else, it's by someone else, and Dr. X, Dr. Uh, Volkswagen's paper, almost exactly the same, except, oh, except um, the first line here, it says, as an investigation of blah, blah, blah. And in Dr. Volkswagen's paper, it says, an investigation, as is taken out. That's, that's about all. Otherwise, the rest of the text is almost the same. And, and it was not detected. And the figures are almost are the same, just taken. Look, this figure is in the original paper, Lao et al. And this is Dr. Volkswagen's picture. He just turned it around a little bit. And already, you know, this was accepted and published. So journals are also to blame. Here's another case uh, from 1998 and 2004, almost the same types of uh, uh, the same wordings in the abstract and in the papers themselves, and the papers and the figures in the papers. See, they're all the same papers. He didn't even bother to turn to turn them around. <laughs> it's easy to make these crimes, so you know the criminals tend to kind of get more and more relaxed. So um, I think these are serious cases, maybe extreme cases, but we have to really be aware of these ex examples. And nowadays we have entered the age of open publications, which really give us even more problems, because you can always publish anything now. 
In the old days, you have the, you have the editor as the gatekeeper. But nowadays, editors are so you know uh, eager to get papers. I get maybe two or three requests a day or a week, you know, to ask me either to be editor or to review papers or to I don't know do something. I at first I reply to them. Now I don't even bother to reply. So many you know open journals looking for for people to kind of prop up the reputation of the journal. So we have to be careful of open publications because online journals offer op more opportunities to publish and uh, mostly with author's fees as well so they get a lot of money as well. However, many journals are so-called predatory. They're hunting for money from authors without due quality control. And publishing in these journals do more harm than good to the authors. So we have to choose our journals very carefully. It used to be, until this year, that there's a so-called Beers list of predatory open access pub publishers. You can still find it in the website. Uh, Beers, you know, is a librarian who looked at these journals and published a list of so-called predatory journals. However, I think he was threatened by lawsuits, so many lawsuits that he discontinued yeah, his uh, web now. It was discontinued early this year due to threats of lawsuits and other reasons. Um, but you can look up also what's called the Scholarly Open Access website. Uh, and uh, most of all, we need good judgment and advice from peers, from our own peers who know the field, uh, so as not to be victims, you know, or to be praise of these predatory journals. So I think it is all a uh, duty of all of us to detect and expose plagiarism. Many programs to detect plagiarism are available and should be offered to researchers by funding and research agencies. Before we came to this meeting in, in front of the room, someone was asking Dr. Brasil, next time we, have, we should have a symposium on res responsible conduct of funding agencies. <laughs> that would be a good idea. Uh, because funding agencies also have to be aware of these problems. And uh, uh, they, uh, they should warn the researchers about these cases. Uh, Dr. Prasit himself, I think a few months ago, arranged a uh, seminar from young people at Chulalongkorn University who uh, developed this program called Akrabisu. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that program was mainly for thesis. So we have to have programs that are directed towards research, research results published in journals rather than just thesis. <coughs> So sometimes just simply Googling can can already detect plagiarism. You know, when I was when I still had time to read thesis and become and, uh, and became uh, uh, thesis uh, 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 examiners, the first thing I look up is some very beautiful words written in the thesis. You know, beautiful passages in the Google and quite a. Often I find that these are written by someone else and taken, you know, so even just using the Google can already detect plagiarism. And in, in Thailand it's easy to detect plagiarism in, in thesis because uh, when the thesis is written in English, uh, you know, the Thais are not so good in English. So their English is very kind of uh, very uh, uh, spotty and uh, full of mistakes. So that's okay, you know, I, I, I think I like this because it means he, she really wrote them. And then suddenly the next paragraph is, you know, just perfect English, you know, beautiful idioms and so on. So that's when I use the Google, ah, <laughs> let's see <laughs> what happens. So uh, plagiarism should be detected and exposed. And if you find it for your students, you should really call the students and really have a serious discussion with her or him. And the responsible people should be penalized. So uh, 
to end my talk, I think uh, I would like to quote what's called the Universal Court of Ethics. This is from the UK government uh, on the Hippocratic you know, paper by Cressy, Cressy, Cressy on Hippocratic Oath for Scientists. And um, uh, this was some years ago, and he said, well, I think this is the code that has been kind of uh, supported by uh, responsible agencies in, in science in the UK. Uh, act with skill and care in all scientific work. Maintain up-to-date skills and assist development in others. Take steps to prevent corrupt practices and professional misconduct. Declare conflict of interest. Be alert to the ways in which research derives from and affects the work of other people and respect the rights and reputation of others. Ensure that your work is lawful and justified. Minimize and justify any adverse effect your work may have on people, animals, and the natural environment. Seek to discuss the issues that science raises for society. Listen to the aspirations and concerns of others. And do not knowingly mislead or allow others to be misled about scientific matters. Present and review scientific evidence, theory, or interpretation honestly and accurately. So, conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, ethics and integrity are very important for researchers since their work affects a wide circle of people, including the public and the researchers themselves. And there could be, or there should be, a Hippocratic oath for medical profession that has not yet come about, but it's something that worth, is worth thinking about. You know, so we're not medical doctors, but our profession is just as important for the uh, security of, of the society. So the uh, Hippocratic oath, the, ma the main message is first do no harm and injustice. So this similarly applies to research. And researchers should always start strive to respect the codes of conduct for research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your great presentation. I, I, I don't know if there's time. You know, I'd like to answer questions if you want. Are there any questions for Dr. I'm Sanchai from Nanotech Nasdaq, a researcher. So thank you very much for a really uh, kind speech on, on his work and, and it's so glad to be able to join this kind of um, conference like the, the seminar because the ethics uh, uh, seem to be really, really important thing. So my question is right now we are trying to you know, put more effort to promote the ethics in Thailand. But in terms of practice, how can how we can make this happen? Like for example, in in this era, we try to make sure that the research can be brought to the reuse. So the researchers tend to do a lot of more works, and there's a lot of good way to promote that. The researchers, if you do a lot of good work, there are a lot of their their rewards and those kind of process that to encourage people to do a lot of research. But in terms of ethics. How can we kind of make it to the real practice in Thailand? Thank you. Very important question. Dr. Prasit already uh, said in the beginning that uh, sometimes over rewarding can bring bad, you know, consequences. You know, in Thailand, research is rewarded. You know, publications are rewarded by money. You know, by most universities, many universities. I never agree with this. Uh, you know, practice, but I had to go along, I guess, because uh, you know people are all saying that you know we are so poor. You know, now that we've got some results, can we get get some rewards? So, so in the end, I I kind of yielded. Uh, but uh, I think it's a very kind of uh, two two edge. It's it's like a two edge sword. It can really do harm as well. So uh, there is a lot of pressure to produce good results, especially that can be applied to the society. So we have to really uh, 
uh, exert our own judgment very carefully. Yes. And, and what I want to say is the culture, is the systems that is actually putting a lot of these rather than you know giving support for researchers to conduct research in a proper manner, like to conduct um, research that is probably beneficial to the society. Just a little bit off, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you that uh, uh, I would uh, call it the age of the KPIs. <laughs> Nowadays, we have to do everything with KPIs you know, how many papers, how many students, you know, uh, and so on. All counted in numbers. Uh, the KPIs are, are okay so long as you don't just use them as the single measure of quality. It's very important that, you know, however many papers you publish, that they do have quality. So uh, if you talk about KPIs to uh, to humanists or to people in so you know, in social fields, many of them will reject you know just the use of KPIs as as indicators because they say it's a quality. Maybe you can publish only one work, uh, but uh, if if that work is so good, then um, you know then that's really a very good uh, measure of quality, and uh, and uh, that person should already be rewarded you know even for one or two papers. But then it's very difficult because how about one or two papers that are not so good quality? <laughs> so uh, the KPIs come in again. So I think that we have to use KPIs with good judgment, and certainly we have to uh, we have to look at the quality of those uh, of those results as well. And uh, and uh, I think this is really not just uh, counting numbers, not just uh, a game of of counting. But it's uh, something that you have to really use you know, your, uh, your professional, if you are a reviewer of results, you really have to use your professional expertise to the full, to do justice to the people that you are you're reviewing. Thank you very much. <laughs>